because August has 31 days. Uh, but nonetheless, it is uh, oil prices trading uh, increasingly higher above uh, uh, 100, uh, well, up above big rally yesterday, up towards 105, slight drop off today, just uh, uh, with uh, uh, sort of moving sideways, if you like. But ultimately, uh, crude oil seems to be uh, moving back to basically where it was probably when we last had these very smart gentlemen on the show. Uh, uh, that is, uh, you know, before the, the big break for the summer. And ultimately, we come back after the big break for the summer. And we are where we are. Mike McGlone, Senior Commodity Strategist, Bloomberg Intelligence. Mike, we had a big event on Friday in the context of the Fed's chairman speaking uh, somewhat hawkishly about the outlook for rates. We had earlier in the week the Saudi Energy Minister speaking somewhat hawkishly about the outlook for oil supply. As we come to the end of summer, what do you think are the takeaways that are guiding this market now? Uh, well, good morning, Sean. Thanks for having me. I think the key takeaway is the Fed's got a sledgehammer out. It's pounding hard. And it's going to keep pounding until either it tightens or market tightens for it. Um, and the fact that energy has had such a substantial rally this year is part of the reason the Fed's being more aggressive with inflation. And I fully expect that the Fed will succeed. And if they don't, they're just going to keep they will succeed. They're pressure. They're they're creating a world crisis with a strong dollar. Um, they're tightening into a recession, akin to 1929, a global recession. And I fully expect crude oil will follow copper and lumber, and even wheat that was up 70 percent in the year and now is barely unchanged, um, and go lower. Um, and that's predicated on the fact that the stock market. Um, has to, even as Mr. Kashkari said, the Fed government of Minnesota said, has to go lower in this case. If it doesn't, the Fed's just going to be more aggressive. So I think we're in a great period of the great reversion of risk assets. And crude oil is not going to be isolated. Um, it's just a matter of time. It's more likely to go back to unchanged on the year. year I'm looking at WTI at 75, and I think it's a pretty good ceiling above $100 a barrel. One wonders how much one can uh, keep oil prices elevated in a world in which China clearly seems to be under some economic duress in the context of most global sort of forecasters are looking at now around a 3% GDP growth for 2022. We had the data out yesterday that China's factory activity likely contracted again in August, not data, Reuters poll, but uh, nonetheless, the outlook there a little bit weak. Let's go to uh, China, to Albert Stromquist, principal at Landstrom Advisors. Albert, coming out of the summer, uh, it does look like the China narrative, at least from an economic point of view is is getting weaker and weaker and there even doesn't look like there's a turnaround in that your thoughts coming out of the summer as we look to the rest of the year where is the chinese economy and energy demand uh, thank you sean and good morning uh, good morning to all uh, Ch china is facing uh what's increasingly looking like a, a perfect storm uh part of it kind of self-imposed through its zero covid uh, policy that led to the, uh, the manufacturing uh, declines uh, earlier this year in the, in the Shanghai market and the bottlenecks that created in the, in the whole logistics business. A lot of that was worked through and things were beginning to right themselves when China was hit by a long 70 day uh, period of intense heat in Southwestern China and drought, which dried up the hydro resources uh, led to a 50% decline in power generation in Sichuan, which had a knock-on effect all the way into the eastern markets around Shanghai, which are supplied by uh, Sichuan's hydropower. So that has led to further decline in manufacturing and a new round of bottlenecks in the system. Um, all of this compounded with the uh, ongoing and deepening crisis in the, in the uh, housing market has left China in, in, a, in a very uncomfortable position, which, uh, according to some pundits now, is increasingly uh, pointing to maybe a, a multi-year workout uh, to, uh, to get through the current crisis. 
Albert, <laughs> just to follow up on that, I mean, the, the general narrative going into the summer break was that the, the, the sort of the finger in the dam problem, the, the real, the, the nux of, of, of China's ailment this year was the, the attachment to the zero COVID policy. And, and now you've just listed off a number of other things. I'm wondering of all of the on the list, the drought, the, the, the real estate, you know, which is now sort of a, a slow car crash two years in terms of the, the, the construction and real estate sector imploding. Which of those or any of them, the solution, the gateway to a recovery? Well, interestingly, from, from where I sit, the, the zero COVID policy has had um, some serious social knock-on effects, uh, which has kind of colored the view of, of many of the Chinese people, especially the, the wealthier and more educated Chinese. And it's reached a point now where, where experts in, um, in healthcare are, are signaling quietly and finally that zero COVID policy is not effective and, and has no winnable end to it. Uh, but to reopen the borders and allow free passage into and out of China creates a fear that there's going to be a large migration of people and wealth out of this country uh, abroad. And, uh, and that's kind of creating some fear and trepidation in the leadership in China to go with it. The, the other manufacturing uh, power generation, these things can be managed over time, uh, but the, the, the social impacts are a bit more delicate here and need to be finessed in ways that don't appear very obvious today. Mike, I think the, 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 the growing question now as we come out of uh, the latest uh, Fed chairman commentary on Friday, uh, you know, he had to sort of, you know, double down on the idea of, you know, I'm serious. No, no, no. I am serious about tackling. You said sledgehammer. Uh, the market doesn't seem to believe him. I'm just wondering from your perspective, I mean, why oil prices are staying so high uh, in the context of the fact that if the sledgehammer's out by the Fed and they're going to knock down the economy, uh, you would think oil prices would be reacting to that. But the markets in general just don't seem to believe Jay Powell. Well, I, I, I think it's starting to believe Jay Powell. The market's in that transition from understanding that it doesn't get the fact that the Fed put is gone forever. I, I compared it to bloodletting from the 18th century. Um, it's gone forever until we have clear signs of major economic stress. And that's coming. I think we're into the point of the most severe economic global recession in our lifetimes. Um, we mentioned China clearly going down. What's China doing? Doing every infrastructure possible um, stimulation they can to support um, the, the, the economy. Cle Europe clearly heading towards a recession. U.S. is already there. We're going to bounce and then go back. It's just a matter of time. The whole world heads towards recession. It's way overdue. And I think what's happening is markets in that period now, it doesn't really get the fact that we're probably going to go into a severe recession. There'll be major earnings. The zombies are going to go under. Maybe 20% of what's in the small cap indexes are going under. This is a big, the big one. And it's just classic economic boom and bust cycles and we're towards that and that we're just tilting towards that cycle the key thing is crude oil is a big part of it why well, i like to point out with crude oil is i really enjoy this narrative when people tell me well supply is not going to come on like it used to yet demand is virtually guaranteed there's demand destruction now we see that everywhere and i've enjoyed that narrative and i just think it's a matter of time that crude oil goes back to its clearing price and right now it's too high now opex been doing a great job jawbone but they know within maybe 10 years, they're going to be redundant. The world is accelerating that process of moving away from fossil fuels, of moving away from fossil fuels and dicey sources, particularly Russia, and accelerating alternative sources. And it's also not so much the acceleration towards EVs and anything, it's the efficiency of consumption. Um, I'm in the States and we get 12% of our unleaded gas now from ethanol. That was People say there has been no infrastructure. <laughs> there's no. Uh, there's been no uh, um, investment. I'm like, well, okay. I'm from a farm. <laughs> we just, you know, well, that corn goes to 
um, ethyl. So to me, it's a matter of time that this happens. And I think it's that, that shift is just starting to turn. It's a global basis. And what I think Albert's a key point is what's happening in China is so overdue. It's not so much China, it's one person. President Xi and another person, President Putin. And the world's realizing these two cozied up. Um, Xi supported this war. It was probably the worst decision ever. And now is the situation, as Albert pointed out, is the economy is collapsing. We see it everywhere. We pointed this out for years. The property market in China, the world's incremental source of crude oil um, demand is going down. Um, and it's just a matter of time. So these are just normal cycles. I unfortunately read the, the book Boom and Bust recently, stuff I could have written. But to me, that's the macro. Well, if you, um, if you take that piece of, uh, I mean, I was quite fascinated by the the note you had earlier in the week. Inflation may fall as fast as it's rallied. Sure. I mean, the the uh, the idea that uh, the inflation does seem to be fairly embedded like a barnacle on a rock. And I mean, we see natural gas prices in Europe per megawatt hour at a multiple of 20 of what they mm -hmm. were uh, a year or so ago. Uh, oil at $100 a barrel. The Saudis indicating last week that they're going to defend some price around this level. Inflation is going to stay quite high, it would seem to me. How do you the the they fall as fast as it's rallied? I'd welcome your insights on that. Let's never forget the number one thing that causes inflation, and that's money supply, monetary policy, just back to simple Milton Freedom. So we had the situation in the U.S. with money supply jump the highest ever, up to 21 percent. It went up 40 percent. And anything that didn't go up 40 percent from the end of 2019 is lagging. Crude oil is up a little bit more than that. But now it's it's dropping at the greatest pace in history, and it's going to continue to do that. So remember what happened. We pulled forward five years of consumption in terms of housing in the U.S., in one example. And now it's flattened out. It's collapsing. It's just normal human nature, but it's the cycles that's always, this is just a normal cycle. It's just from an extreme base. It's the base effect. So when crude oil goes from 50 to 130, which it kind of did this year, and then it's at 100. It's got to go from 100 to 130 to get a 30 percent. What if it goes back down and continues to go back towards 50, which has been the base cost of production in the U.S. for the last five years? That's deflation. It's virtually guaranteed, John. It's the base effect. And it's, it's, it's the stickiness that I really enjoy is when people start losing jobs, which is happening already. And we just take that normal base effect and move it lower it's going to be deflation and that Fed's going to get and the number one factor to watch is the U.S. stock market. If it continues to trickle down, which I fully expect, you're going to limit the ability for people to buy stuff. That's deflation. In fact, let's remember the environment before COVID was somewhat deflationary. Now we've accelerated. You just mentioned natural gas in Europe. What is that doing for consumer spending? It's going to shut down everything. People are going to have to use a a large portion of their income to pay for energy, shutting down demand, it's gonna find that supply. And in the meantime, it's gonna create that global recession which resets everything. And a good example, I'll just leave you with this, is one simple example in the US is unleaded gas demand. It's turning over, this is implied, I use a 52 week average, it's turning over at a higher velocity than it did in 2008. And we've already had that peak around five in the price of unleaded gas in the US, now it's around four. Yes, the US is releasing the SPR, but part of this is a key thing is, remember, there's an election coming up in the U.S. and they need prices to go lower. The party in, in, uh, in, uh, in power and they'll get it. Albert, looking at China and from the point of view of uh, economic recovery, uh, China reported weaker than expected growth in Q2, uh, only 0.4%, not surprising given that the lockdown was quite severe in that quarter. But looking forward, uh, is there any other tools in the toolbox uh, for China to sort of stimulate their way into more positive, into uh, faster or more substantial growth, uh, uh, other than maybe lifting the uh, COVID, zero COVID policy? not without stepping on the toes of some very strong vested interests in China. And that's that's creating kind of a, um, a, a political uh, situation akin to walking on glass uh, for the leadership here. Uh, and there are feedback loops as well. Uh, while the uh, yuan is currently soft against the dollar, that's stimulating Chinese exports. But at the same time, as Mike pointed out, high inflation in the West. And then tightness in consumers' pocketbooks is going to 
destroyed demand for uh, for hard goods coming out of the Chinese market, and that will that will hit them next year uh, as the orders begin to uh, materialize for 2023. So, um, you know, th there there aren't any obvious. Uh, well, if you take if you take the the idea, then if we assume, and, and increasingly there's growing analysis that assumes that once the uh, China as Communist Party and it will meet or not annual, but the meeting is over and there is the uh, reappointment of President Xi for a third term, that that will begin the end of the COVID, zero COVID policy, the, the need to uh, there will be a window to soften into that. Uh, uh, and uh, if and, and I assume let's assume that does happen, the re-election re and the softening of the COVID, zero COVID what then is the outlook for the Chinese economy? Because you could see them coming very aggressively back into the, for example, the LNG spot market. Yes, yeah, look, the, the, the energy supply to China is, is not the issue today. They're well supplied both in crude oil and, uh, and in natural gas from their pipelines. And as the economy begins to expand, yes, they can uh, rely on LNG uh, to backfill their, their energy demand. Uh, what's actually happening here is that coal has become king again. Right? Uh, China has recognized that it doesn't have a well risk managed uh, uh, power generation portfolio. Uh, and the, the events this summer in uh, southwestern China have only underscored their weakness. So now the provinces have, have this year uh, green lighted eight and a half gigawatts of new coal fired power generation. Uh, coal imports from Russia, coal imports from Indonesia, and from Australia, which have been embargoed for two years, are now beginning to step up. So at, at, at the same time, they're having what appears to be uh, climate change effects, uh, which they've never experienced before. The movements they're taking are like drinking hemlock to cure a headache. Yeah, so I, I don't, I, I, I don't, I don't see too much joy. It's, you know, the, the whole zero COVID policy here has worked very well in providing a mechanism to, to manage movements in the population. Right? Um, and, and that's played very, very well to the interest of the party. So th there's not a lot of interest on their part to lift these restrictions uh, before they've kind of un understood what they really want the future here to look like. <clears throat> Uh, Mike, the we're going into, I believe, the uh, Labor Day weekend in the United States, which is sort of officially the end of the summer, uh, and we look to the to the to the sort of fall and the winter ahead. And standing out with big red flashing lights there is the U.S. Uh, midterm elections for the Congress. Uh, I'm wondering what bearing that may have what will the mood will it shift as it comes out of memorial weekend all of these somewhat uh, armageddon forecasts that you're putting forward will become a lot more front and center in a way that maybe the distraction of summer holidays has kept them off the the sort of center stage yes well the the um the narrative is um vote out the current party in power and inflation is a number one reason to do that. Now, Biden's come back a little bit in the polls recently, um, and this is all the midterms, but it's a clear trend towards, unless the Republicans mess it up, it's just a classic shift in its check and balance of the normal cycle in U.S. politics. So we're going to be voting out Democrats at a pretty rapid pace. I'd fully expect that. Um, the key thing that I think is most important here is I'm predicting normal cycles um, and I find it interesting when people look for things like the Fed put and stuff, that stuff's over. Um, this is a new economy and it's just a big shift. So that cycle will move over. We're going to more have more in this. We realize the revenge of fossil fuels where people realize, OK, we need fossil fuels. Republicans are going to back more towards drill at will. <laughs> we, we need that. Um, let's, let's not let grandma freeze at her house, her, her uh, house in the woods or cabin. Um, so that to me is just a guaranteed. I think the key thing to point out here is 
is this is just a normal cycle in terms of politics, in terms of markets, in terms of inflation. And it's just happening at a scale we can only compare it to normal cycles of what really happened. This is comparable. I think we're going to see the second, the last few months of this year akin to 2008, but it's global now. And I like to ask the question, what stops this current process of us going towards a recession of housing collapse and of stock market going down? Is it going to be the Fed? Absolutely not. Is it going to be China? Absolutely not. Is it going to be a weaker dollar? No way. Nothing stops it. It's just a matter of time. This is inevitable. And a key thing to mention is what Albert mentioned is, is the knock-on effects. What's happening in China to me is historic. It's his peak China. No one wants to go and live there. We have a dictator. It's not China anymore. We have a dictator who's not understanding what's happening in the global rapidly advancing technology. And it's, um, it, it's just this big bubble. We've seen it happen in Soviet Union. We've seen it happen in, in, in Japan. It doesn't last forever. Now it's going negative. So to me, that's where the world's going. And this is part of that shift over. So I look at from a commodity. The commodities I think you want to own in the long term are the metals, but they're showing right now, shorter term, i.e. industrial metals, that this is a recession. It's going to get serious and there's no hurry to buy anything yet, except things, things like risk like um, storage of value assets, I think, like uh, things like U.S. long bonds and eventually gold. Let's go to the survey question uh, and give the room a chance to look at this question of OPEC. Uh, OPEC plus my statement won't cut official oil production output quotas this year. Uh, the, 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 the noise last week about that, it just seems uh, a little bit, Either the market has rallied quite dramatically on the back of these comments, but ultimately there is a big gap between actual physical production and the OPEC quota. There's about a two, nearly 3 million barrels that, of the, that OPEC plus is not producing, and they've never been able to meet their new quota levels. So my question ultimately is, OPEC won't cut official oil production output quotas this year, agree or disagree? Uh, welcome the view, and we'll put that out on on social media. Albert, speaking to Mike's point there, uh, looking through all of the China noise and the on the front end, if you like today's headline, uh, that we're just at the end of this thirty year bull run in China, and all of these things are uh, just uh, you know sort of representations of that. Uh, your thoughts on that as a, as a sort of a, a bigger picture analysis? You, you know that history has shown that when, um, when people, when countries' economies are squeezed, they often resort to bellicosity, right? To, to deflect the public's discontent, discontent right, with the policies of the government. And that bellicosity is, is very clearly written here in the uh, in the Taiwan Straits, so I, I don't no one I don't think wants to wants to see conflict, uh, but it is one mechanism that could be used that the U.S. has used, you know, very uh, very very willingly in the, in the past uh, to deflect uh, public discontent. Discontent. So, well, we certainly we had a, a, a uh, announcement overnight that the by the Taiwanese government announcing that they were willing to uh, uh, now move forward and shoot down Chinese drones that were uh, violating their um, their airspace. Something that they have. So the potential for that to to escalate uh, looks. But my question, I suppose, Albert, is more directed towards. The typical stimulus response that China has deployed here again, and I did sort of uh, state earlier in the year that I thought it would fail, uh, the idea that you can put more money into cement, more money into roads, more money into the heavy infrastructure, which they've done for 30 years and it's delivered. That, go that goose kept blowing, laying golden eggs for a very long time. That sort of strategy is that over? Can that keep delivering uh, if they were to put the full velocity behind it again? In, in public infrastructure, there are still some holes in the system that can be addressed uh, with airport reconstruction, extension of railroads, extension of uh, major highway networks and all that can be done, sure. Um, housing is overbuilt, uh, particularly with the population facing decline in the coming decades. There's, there's no impetus to build more housing here in China. 
So that that part of it, I think, is uh, is, is 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 history. Part of the last thirty years, uh, they're certainly putting a, a lot of capital into building their maritime uh, naval fleet, uh, both both military and uh, and, and trade as well. Uh, so you know, oil tankers, uh, product product freighters, and all. A uh, huge, huge boom here in uh, in shipbuilding, <clears throat> and those are all government-controlled corporations, government-owned enterprises. <clears throat> Mike, I want to just give one last sort of drill down into your thesis of the outlook. Uh, obviously, f fairly bearish to put it mildly, but that the the we're into now september obviously in, in a day or so and uh, the beginning of, of a sort of post summer period and and yet the the sort of the, the boy who cried wolf on recession has been kind of in the headlines for a while and the equity markets keep spitting out the hook uh, the 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 idea that um, uh, that the that there the this the, the markets of the economy half the states of the united states are at record low unemployment, uh, under 3%. Uh, I mean, the, the macro picture and, and the financial markets, while had a big wobble in the mid uh, early summer, early summer rather, came back strongly since. Uh, the, it, uh, are you seeing a, a, what sounds like a sort of a, a real cliff rather than a, a kind of a valley? I'm just wondering where this cliff comes from because it doesn't seem like it's anywhere obvious in sight other than you know the fed are having to curtail inflation gradually then suddenly and i think we're not near the suddenly point yet we're in the gradually point yet when we have to remember what got us here the greatest stimulus in the history of mankind is going away at the fastest pace ever that's that fact we can only do so much we've pulled forward all that economic growth now it's collapsing Housing's a good example. I, I'm in the condo in Miami, from condos in Miami to land in, in farmland in Illinois, they all went up 40%. <laughs> what, what did uh, money supply go up? It's just the classic case. Now that's all being taken away. And so to me, this is such a classic cycle. It's way overdue. We need a good cleansing correction. And the what I look at, it's going to be so good to come out of this. No more zombie companies. No more looking at the Fed every time the market goes down. That Those days are over forever. No more looking at China. That's a key thing where Albert needs to be on here. It's so important that it's completely politically incorrect in this country to do any form of business in China. And to divest from China is politi politically correct because they're supporting the war and they've made themselves our enemy, which we, it's just so... Politically, both sides of the aisle are anti-China. So any business that can, will, is pulling anything they can, any type of labor out of China. It's just give them 10 years. It's just we saw this happen before and it's happened in the past. So to me, this is part of that macro that's way overdue. The Fed puts gone forever and inflation. And that's part of the thing. You see those numbers are sticking. It's still ticking around 8 percent. I fully expect them to be negative a year from now, if not more partly when the stock market goes down. And if it doesn't go down, the Fed's going to make it go down. It's that clear to me. And it's just a question of time. But remember, this happened in 2007, 8. I remember we had labor shortages. The Fed started tightening when inflation was still going up because the housing market went down. That's all turned. And like I say, one key in indicator is simply U.S. unleaded gas demand is rolled over at the, the greatest pace. Actually, it's comparable to um, when we plunge in Q1 20 with COVID. Let's get the survey result and give Albert the last word here. OPEC won't uh, two to one agree. Uh, Albert, I set that up for you because I just wanted to dig close out with a sense of what the relationship between China, which is the world's largest oil importer, and OPEC OPEC plus. It, it ha this the strategy of Russia, the strategy of Saudi last week to defend ninety hundred dollar oil. Of course, for the largest importer of crude oil in the world, that's quite painful. Uh, uh, India behind it, another big, huge market. But just focusing on China, where is the? I mean, these are there's contradictions in everything, right? My enemy's enemy is my friend. Russia is my best friend, but on oil, it's you know giving me a discount. Saudi's hitting me through the eyes, uh, but. Where do you put that relationship at the moment, the OPEC plus the oil price versus uh, the, the Chinese market, which, of course, is so important to Saudi Arabia? 
I don't see OPEC plus as, as being a policy issue for China. Uh, I agree, their, their, their crude is coming out of Iraq and Saudi and Russia and Venezuela. Uh, so o OPEC plus is, is, is not a policy block. And I don't see them taking any actions here to disrupt OPEC plus, either reinforce it or, or weaken it. <laughs> So decisions made that sort of prop up the oil price, China will take that on the chin. Uh, that's well, they will take it on the chin, yes. But I mean, they are getting the Russian oil at discount. Yeah. So you know, but that they, discount has has at least that discount has has shrunk quite a bit. Uh, it's only uh, up to about five dollars an hour, five to eight dollars. Uh, still a discount, nonetheless. Of course, what's happened too is that China imports have also dropped off, given the. Uh, the economic demand at the moment. We have to wrap it up there. Uh, Mike McGlone and Albert Stromquist, thank you so much for your insights and comments today. I just sort of close out with um, an additional uh, uh, point that, um, that was Mike referenced there, the quantitative tightening, the Fed's quantitative tightening is set to hit its sort of full strides as it tries to uh, shrink its nine trillion dollar balance sheet that it blew up during the COVID crisis, and as it drains that liquidity from the market, uh, what dominoes will fall from that? But it's worth to keep an eye on it. It's a little bit inside baseball once you get into treasuries and T bills and all mortgage backed securities. But nonetheless, it's the Fed draining liquidity from the from the marketplace, and that clearly has consequences, as it did going the opposite direction. Thanks, Albert. Thanks, Mike. Take care. Talk to you soon.